All right, you can turn your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be talking today about what does the Bible say about alcohol and drunkenness. I have, of course, voiced my opinion many times over the years, but I don't have an actual dedicated study to this subject. Um, so we're going to see what the Scriptures have to say about this. Is, do, do the Scriptures condemn all alcohol for any reason? Does it say that some is okay in certain situations? Um, total alcohol, there's no prohibitions on it. What does the Bible say? Let's look about that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And let me just stress again the importance of having a King James Bible. You can look up the Scriptures, make sure I'm telling you the truth. Again, ex let me explain what a Bible-believing Christian is. I believe that this King James Bible is God's Word. I don't correct it. I don't change it. I take it for what it says. And it changes me. I don't change it. Okay, that means, in other words, I can be held to a standard. You have some preachers out there, most of them actually, uh, they don't have any standards except for their own. They'll use multiple versions. They'll correct whatever version they have with Greek or Hebrew, and then they correct Greek and Hebrew. They say, well, this edition or that edition, I prefer this Greek text or that Greek text. Understand that there are many Greek texts. There is no the Greek. That's not true. So just to put that as a little bit of an introduction, um, in the system of Christianity that I am in, the true system, in other words, uh, we hold to the standards of a book. It isn't just church traditions that man made up and whatever else. The book is the standard. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 through 21. Let's read that here. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Stop there for just a second. Um, the answer to your question is you have to study. And you also have to rightly divide the word of truth. You can't just say everything is mine from Genesis to Revelation. All, everything applies to me. No, it doesn't. And you have to understand that. God wrote. He dispensed his grace to different groups of people in different ways down through the centuries. Obviously, if you go back to the Old Testament, back in here, they're sacrificing animals. There's a temple, a synagogue. They're going to it. There's a Levitical priesthood. New Testament, that stuff's not here. Okay, in terms of Levitical priesthood, we're priesthood of the believer, I get it, but um, there are no church buildings in the New Testament. No holy building to go to and sacrifice animals. So there are differences in the Bible. Now, does the Bible say the same thing about alcohol the whole way through the Bible? No, it doesn't. I'm going to show you the proof today. Continuing here, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now there, drunkenness per se is not condemned, but what is a vain and uh, profane and vain babbling? What better type of people to do that than a drunkard? You see a bunch of drunkards and things, they're profane and vain babbling. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love you. You're my best friend. What was, what was your name again? You know. <laughs> yeah, profane and vain babblings. I won't use the profanity that they would typically use too. I've been around plenty of drunks over the years. Um, thankfully, I was never a drunkard myself. Verse 17, And their word will eat as doth a can canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You're supposed to be different if you're a Christian. You name the name of Christ, I'm a Christian of Christ, in other words, then you better depart from iniquity. There needs to be a difference between you and the lost world. Verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Now, I want you to remember that. Verse 21 there, you are supposed to purge yourself. You are supposed to live a godly life, sanctification, your second salvation. Your first salvation is going to heaven and not to hell. Okay, that's the first one. That's what Jesus did on the cross. The second one is up to you, all right? Paul writes to Timothy at one point, and he says, In doing this, thou shalt boast, save thyself and them that hear thee. He's giving him instruction in righteousness. You have to do things after you get saved so that you don't make a mess of your life. 
You don't lose the first salvation when you get saved. That's there. That's done. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Ephesians chapter uh, 1 and chapter 4 talks about the same thing there. That's settled. But you can make a mess of your life as a Christian, a born-again Christian. You can really make a mess of your life if you don't want to sanctify certain things out. Purge those things out of your life. And we're going to talk about alcohol in this study, but I had to start out with this concept there. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. People can go to the Bible and you can prove that alcohol is fine. And there are people that can go and they can prove that all alcohol is bad. Which one is it? Well, that depends on how you look at it. No, it doesn't. It depends on how it's rightly divided. And you have to go through and rightly divide it and you submit yourself to what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You know, you will find, I've been saved a long time, I've been preaching a long time, you will find that the best freedom that there is, is when you actually study the Bible and you really live by the pages of Scripture and rightly divide it. That brings the most freedom. That's when you really have it good. People, oh, you're just a Bible thumper and whatever else, and oh, such a terrible life, you can't do this, you can't do that. No, it's, I don't want to do those things. I don't want to go out and be a drunkard. I know what it, I've seen what it does. I've told this story many times. My former neighbor was a drunken Roman Catholic. He died in his own vomit. Throwing up, fell forward, died in it. What a way to go. And there's plenty of people that have just wrecked their lives. And I've seen that and I say, oh, no, don't want any of that. My father was an EMT, worked with the ambulances and things going out. Stories he'd come home tell us, these terrible stories of guys that were drunk and the accidents they'd get into and everything. No, thank you. I saw my uncle ruin his marriage, ruin his life with alcohol. Married to a wonderful woman, messed up his marriage. She left him because of alcohol. So I can see that real world stuff and I can apply it to what the scriptures say and say, no, thank you. Don't want it. I'm not going to go through the Bible and try to twist the Bible and tweak it to say it's okay. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Oh, we'll get to that. Don't you worry. If you're a boozer, I'm going to be kicking you in this study. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, a standard for a New Testament Christian here. All things are lawful unto me. Can you drink? Can you drink alcohol? Well, according to that verse right there, it says that you can. All things. It doesn't say all except for alcohol. All things are are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. Does it help you in your walk Does it with Jesus Christ to get drunk? No, it doesn't. Is it expedient? Is it? Does it get you a better job? Does it get you the right kind of wife going down to a bar and getting drunk there? I don't think so. All things are lawful for me, but, key thing here, I will not be brought under the power of any. Oh, there you go. You want a good New Testament kick against alcohol? There you go. You say, well, I can drink it. I can socially drink it. I don't get drunk. It doesn't bring me under its power. Okay, then this verse is not aimed at you. I mean, it is in the sense of you have the liberty to do that. But what I'm saying is when you get people and you are losing control of your senses, you can't speak correctly, you can't walk correctly, you're falling and stumbling around, you are under something's power. And again, understand what alcohol is. There is such a thing, there's different types of alcohol. And you say, well, yeah, beer, vodka, you know. No, no, I'm talking about real fermented liquors versus chemical types of liquor and alcohol. You need to understand the difference there. There are ones that can actually be good for you in moderation. There are others that are bad for you even if they are in moderation. They're poisoning you. Okay, if you drink too much alcohol, the reason you get drunk is because it's hurting your system. You've been poisoned. That's why when you come out of it, you throw up. Your body has natural reaction to being, being poisoned, and that is you vomit. Your body says, I need to expel this out. I can't do anything with this. You eat, you overeat, you expel out the extra. Your body says, no, too much. You get a bunch of poison into your body says, I can't digest this or anything else. It's just poisonous chemicals and out it comes. That's what happens when you drink too much alcohol. That's why you get a headache. That's why you get other bad things. 
Look up the symptoms of being poisoned, you know, and then look up over drinking, being, a, you know, an alcoholic, getting drunk. They're the same. Hmm. That's why if you drink so much and keep drinking and drinking and you don't stop, you just become an alcoholic, you can eventually get cirrhosis of the liver, eat little holes all through your liver, and then you die. God doesn't want that for you. Proverbs chapter 31. Alcohol has a power to it. And it's, it's funny because they actually call it spirits. Hmm. Do you want to be brought under the power of spirits? The Holy Spirit. But uh, you don't need alcohol to get His power. Pro Proverbs chapter 31 verses 1 through 9. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What my son, the king writing to his son, that would make the son a prince. And what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. What would destroy a king? It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Huh. Um, so is there a group of people that God says you shouldn't drink? Those that are in royal positions. Those that have positions of authority that they should be there to, to say, hey, I need to be there to judge people and, and whatever. And I need a clear mind. Think about it this way. Let's just say that you had a real problem and you had to have open heart surgery. And there's two doctors and you get to pick which one you want. The one doctor, natural health eating and he's really in, in good shape. He just got in from a morning jog. He's ready to go, ready to perform the surgery if you want to pick him. The other guy, uh, he was out a little bit late last night, had a little bit too much to drink, and, and he had a glass or two this morning, but he's, he's ready to go too. Which one do you want doing your open heart surgery? I think that would be the guy in the good shape. Why? You want him to have a steady hand as he's in there with that scalpel, cutting. Clear mind, steady hands. You don't uh, want somebody that's going to be messing around with alcohol to try to do a very important surgery like that, right? But what's our text saying here? Our text is rebuking people in authority. It's funny because if you do some research into the uh, British, you know, <clears throat> royal family, yeah, about as royal as a, you know, yeah, <laughs> pond scum, um, those people drink all the time. I'll show you a bunch of pictures here as I'm talking. It's, it's just incredible. The queen, you know, she drinks a glass of champagne before she goes to bed. She drinks four glasses throughout the day, every day. And, and uh, you know, just drinking, drinking, drinking. Oh, here comes Obama and here comes Ronald Reagan. And, uh, you know, all these different presidents are coming. Oh, let's, let's drink. <laughs> and you say, that's oh, just her. Uh, no, it actually goes into the rest of the family as well. Just picture after picture, you know, the... Um, uh, William and Kate or whatever, they had drinking clubs in college and, and everything else. Um, you say, well, then that would contradict the scriptures. Well, if they were true royals, yeah, but they're not. Um, what are they? Well, the Bible says here, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Um, that's why they drink so much. Um, because they are not real royals. They have no authority, no say in anything over there. Um, they can't stay, let's just say one of them got saved, just to prove a point. They wouldn't be able to step up and say, hey, I'm taking over here of the government, parliament, you step aside, I'm going to start ruling things and making some righteous judgments in this nation. They couldn't do it if they wanted to. That's why they're drinking all the time. And I showed this in one of my studies. If you look into the whole thing of uh, London Bridges Down, the code name for when the queen dies. And um, when, they, when that happens... They're going to kill her. They did it to her father. You know, he was, I guess, failing in health or something, and they injected him with, with uh, morphine and cocaine. Look into it. I did a live stream on it. They're going to do the same thing to the queen. 
keep her around until just the right time. Okay, we need immediate distraction. Hey, how about the queen dying? Yeah, let's do that. Oh, uh, London Bridge is down. Okay, get her into the hospital or whatever, hospital, inject her. Down she goes. Oh, the queen. Oh, remembering the queen and everything else. Yeah. I'm sure that the breweries would probably really mourn when she dies because they'll be losing one of their best customers. You know, but uh, um, royal pedigree people are not supposed to be out getting drunk all the time. But you say, well, okay, but what's the, what's the deal here? You know, give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Is there a cause for people to get drunk and things, essentially? If they're dying and they're in a lot of pain, well, right there you have it. Yeah. But the king should be clear thoughts right up until the very last minute. Well, I'm in a lot of pain. I'm not going to get drunk. No. I don't want anything to do with it. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. One of the uh, favorites of the boozers out there. Paul recommended wine. Yes, he did. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23. Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Um, is this talking about the big commercially produced uh, wines with all the different chemicals that they put in? No, it's not. It's talking about an actual fermented grape juice that would actually be good to help with digestion. Um, why would it be good for that? Well, it would have probiotics in it, helpful bacteria. You get the same thing from sauerkraut. That's fermented cabbage. Wine is fermented grapes. Um, you would get yogurt or kefir. That's fermented dairy. Uh, products. There's all kinds of different types of, you know, things that you can ferment. Um, another one would be kombucha. You can, for, it's kind of a fermented black tea with other things added to it, types of berries and other, you know, things like that. I'm saying, you know, pretty healthy. Um, apple cider vinegar, raw apple cider vinegar is a t type of fermented apple juice, essentially. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can do to get those probiotics into your stomach. And by the way, if you've taken a lot of antibiotics in your life, antibiotics, or if you eat meat that's a uh, big ag type of meats, where they're injecting antibiotics into the animals, you know, kind of a, they're sick till proven uh, healthy <laughs> or something. Uh, in other words, they, they inject it in whether the animal's sick or not. And so you get, you see antibiotic free meats in the grocery store. That's the kind of stuff that you want, or just get from local farms that don't inject their animals with all kinds of, you know, antibiotics. Or go out into the wild and hunt wild animals. Hunting license and the whole th thing, excuse me. Um, or uh, raise your own grass-fed type animals. That's very important. But if you have a lot of antibi antibiotics coming into your system, it kills your healthy bacteria in your stomach, your healthy gut flora, uh, if you study it which I have, I'm big time in natural health. And what happens is then you start to create all kinds of health issues. You start to have indigestion and, and some really bad stuff. So Timothy had some things wrong with him. And, you know, Paul said, you know, there in verse 23, um, for thine off and thine often infirmities, thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So Timothy was getting sick quite a bit. And Paul says, okay, drink no longer water, but use a little wine. It's not going out and well, social drinking or, you know, whatever, a little wine. That's what Paul's recommending to Timothy. So is it wrong? Can you just say, well, I'm not going to have any wine for any reason at all. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible condemns all alcohol. All alcohol is, is the devil's pee or something. You know, you hear this type of thing. That's what my grandfather actually used to say. Um, well, that's not correct. See, you have to study. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, most wines out there, I wouldn't go near them with a 10-foot pole. Um, I've tried some of them, and they're, they taste like cough syrup to me. They're just, you know, uh, you know not very good. Uh, we were, I'll talk more about the thing of, of 
uh, communion and, and whatever else in the towards the end of the study here. But um, I just I have no time for alcohol of any kind. Um, my ancestry goes back to a lot of royal bloodlines and everything, and and so you know, and the Lord put me in the position of a preacher, and so I try to stay away from it. Let me show you. First Timothy chapter three. Go back to First Timothy chapter three, verse one through seven. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine. It doesn't say you can't drink it, it's just saying not given to it. You're, you know, people say, well, does it mean give in, like he gives in to it? Well, not really. Not given to wine is. If you're given over to something, that means you're drinking it all the time, kind of like the... <laughs> Queen Elizabeth over there in, in England. You're not given to it. it and I, I don't really need it. Whatever else. Oh, I need a little bit now and then, you know, just my stomach's a little bit upset and I don't have access to any other, you know, fermented type of foods. Okay, fine. Whatever. But you know your limit. You just, uh, no, I'm not letting that stuff, you know, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I'll not be brought under the power of any. No thank you. Little tiny bit, try it. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. Done. That's what it means there. Doesn't mean total abstinence. You can't teach that. No striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know how to rule his own house, how shall if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Um, part of having a good conversation, I mean, you know, again, think about this. I have bumper magnets on my vehicle, scripture verses, links to my website, kingjamesvideoministries.com. Um, now, what would people think if I pull in, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you die tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? You know, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. On my vehicle, kingjamesvideoministries.com. And I walk in, and I come out, and I have two cases of beer or something. People look and go, hypocrite. Look at this guy. You see? I'm supposed to have a good report of them that are without. Hey, uh, uh, Mr. Denlinger, would you like to have a glass of wine? No, thank you. Don't touch the stuff. No, I'm not really interested. That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, I'm not, I don't consider myself to be a bishop, but the point is it's a high standard for a man that preaches the Word of God. There's supposed to be some things there that you're supposed to be different. Proverbs chapter 23. Let's go back there in the Old Testament. Because again, we're going to see a lot of the things, the text that you go to some conservative Baptist type of church and they'll say, you know, well, the Bible plainly teaches, you know, now go back to the Old Testament or something like this. Um, Proverbs 23, verse 29 through 35. Let's read these verses. Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Um, you're tarrying long at it. It's not a little wine like Paul recommended to Timothy. See, boozers will come along and they'll say, Paul recommended wine to Timothy. Jesus turned water into wine. So there you go. Uh, no, you're talking about tarrying long at the wine. Little tiny bit is not going to make you drunk. You will not lose control. You will not be brought under the power of the spirits behind that alcohol. Let me say it that way. Verse 31. Look not thou upon the, vi the wine when it is red, when it giveth his collar in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. It's fermented. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Interesting because profane and vain babblings come because you don't study. Per perverse things, profane, profane and vain babblings. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Perfect description of a drunkard. 
All right, you say, well, see, there you go. How can you duck this stuff right there? Condemnation of alcohol. Everybody, it's, it's, it's a condemnation for everybody. Really? Well, let's look at uh, verse 26 before we get into all that there. Go back to verse 26. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Who is Solomon writing to? Again, you see, so you have to rightly divide the word of truth. Who is he writing to? Is he writing to a Christian? No, it's a king writing to his son. That's the way it is. And you can't just take that and say, well, you know, it, it applies to everybody. You know, be real ultra conservative, you know, temperance and teetotaler and whatever else they call it. You know, alcohol is wrong for any reason. That's not what the Bible teaches. Unless you are in a position of authority, then, you know, stay away from it. Don't go near it. You have to understand that. All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. You say, well, I don't have any royal pedigree or anything else. Well, if you're born again, you do. Even if you don't according to the flesh, you do according to the Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 11. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, speaking about Gentiles like myself and most of you my viewers, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Um, does it make any sense at all to get drunk? I mean, boy, I'm just thinking so clearly today and I can walk and my speech is not slurred. But I really should do something about that. You know, okay. Um, all right, I'm going to go into the bar there. I'm going to get a little bit too much to drink. Don't have to carry me out to my vehicle. I don't forget my brother-in-law was at a real fancy wedding. His sister married into big money in, in the Washington, D.C. area. A lot of families tied in with Lockheed Martin, defense contractor there, big money. And uh, he went to this wedding and the mother was, you know, some, they were, you know, multimillionaires or whatever. And she got so drunk at the wedding reception that they had to carry her out. One person grabbed one leg and, you know, another guy, another leg, and then two other guys with two arms. And they, they carried her out to the car and they were like, oh, 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 you know, boy, high class there. You know, we actually had a pub uh, up in the uh, area of Mount Chase up there, Shin Pond Pub, and it said, uh, they used to have a saying on the wall, and it says, come with class, leave as trash. Boy, that's classy. That's the kind of thing that you want in a, in a good area and whatever else. That's, that's the kind of thing that you should promote, you know. Thankfully, it went out of business. Another guy bought it, and then he went out of business. But, uh, you know, I remember some Hollywood actress many years ago before I got saved, and she was on the David Letterman show or something, and and uh, I don't remember what her name was, but she's the, they said, you know, what are you going to be doing for New Year's Eve or whatever? She said, I don't know, but I'm just going to get really, really drunk. And everybody's ah, ah, in the crowd. And I thought, that's sad. That's pretty pathetic. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to get really drunk. Why? Can't handle the reality. Worked very hard to get to the position where she's at probably did all kinds of evil things to get there, and then uh, have to drink to forget it. Pretty sick. Pretty bad. Um, why would you, as a Christian, want to be associated with that? Why would you want to go in, to the alcohol store and uh, go in there with all the wicked advertisements and everything else, knowing that you're in there with people that are drunken wife beaters, and child molesters and everything else, and you're going to be supporting that industry? Really? Um, you see, you can make the arguments. Well, they say, Brother Brian, you're a preacher. You shouldn't be preaching and, and getting drunk and things. That's true. That is very true. You say, well, I'm just a regular old Christian and things, so I, if it doesn't really matter if I get drunk occasionally. Uh, I don't think so. You are a royal priesthood right there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You have no excuse. You are tied to Jesus Christ. You are bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh. Why would you get drunk? 
You want spiritual fellowship with the Lord, but you're going to invite other spirits in through alcohol? Not a good idea. You say, well, I can drink and, and I, just, I know enough to drink and I don't ever get drunk. I just like the taste of certain wines or certain things and whatever else. Well, okay. If you're not brought under the power of it, that's fine. Uh, there are people that are like that. They just, for whatever reason, they like the taste of it. People in other countries and things. I know drinking of alcohol in other countries is, is actually, you know, something that they do. And, and they look down upon drunkenness. Well, okay, fine. Not a problem. I don't have anything wrong with that. I'm not going to condemn somebody just because I see alcohol or whatever else. They might have a purpose for it. I'm actually going to show you some of my alcohol just here in a minute. I said, you have alcohol? Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you two other things about you being royalty. As a Christian, when you get born again, doesn't matter what your past is. When you're born again, you are part of royalty. Uh, God's royalty. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 through 10. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation. Again, understand that what the 24 elders are. If you want to see the video, I did a whole video laying this whole thing out. People say, we don't really know what it is. It's the 12 Jewish patriarchs, and then the 12 Jewish disciples. Well, then they couldn't be from every uh, kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. Okay, no. If you study, there are 12 boundaries that God set up in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Those 12 boundaries, you get two from each. Two times 12 is 24. Okay, that's how it makes sense. What are their names? Who are they? I don't know. That's up to God. But there's no question about it. They're not all Jews. It's not 24 elders that are all Jews. That's nonsense. That's a ridiculous heresy if you hear that. But look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Kings and priests, we shall reign on the earth. I've been seeing people in the comments, you know, well, there's no teaching that, you know, there is no millennial kingdom. That's not there. Yes, there is. I preached about it years ago. You can see the studies on that. You say, well, this, this is a... Uh, Saints that go th into the Great Tribulation. Uh, no, it's not. They're there before the first seal is opened. Okay, and then you have the uh, voice of many angels in verse 11. Before the Antichrist is even unleashed on the earth. It's a problem if you're a postie. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go back there to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to show you that millennial reign is promised to a Christian. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. By the way, um, the elect there, it's a reference to the Jews. It's not a reference to those people that were pre-chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, and therefore they're going to be forced to be saved at one point in time. Then you don't have to endure all things for the elect's sake. It doesn't make any sense. Peter or Paul here, he's writing, and he says, uh, you know, I'm doing all things for the elect's sakes. He's meaning the Jews, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He's talking about the Jewish people. All right? Again, I've done studies on that. Verse 11, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. The resurrection, in other words. If we suffer... We shall also reign with him. Lines up with Revelation chapter 5. If we deny him, he also will deny us. You say, oh, oh no, then we lose our salvation. He denies us. That's not what it means. Keep reading. Verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. If you're born into the body of Christ, you are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, he isn't going to amputate you. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Him that cometh unto me, unto me, I will in no wise cast out. No man is able to pluck them out of my hand. And you get these, you know, nuts and they'll say, well, you can pluck yourself out. Well, if you think that you're more powerful than God, apparently, 
Okay, and, you know, good luck with that. But uh, um, you have eternal security, but your first salvation is eternally secure. Your second salvation is not. You have to sanctify yourself. You have to purge things out of your life. And drunkenness is not going to help you with that. If you can drink a little bit of alcohol now and then or whatever else, and it doesn't affect you, you're not brought under the power of it for whatever reason, okay, fine. Before we continue, I'm going to show you here the alcohol that I have in my life. You ready? See if it says it on here. Uh, no, it does not say it on here what type it is. But uh, here we go. Right there. Can you see that? Uh, it looks a little bit blurry. There we go. This is called ghost pipe tincture. A tincture is made when you take herbs and you put very high proof alcohol, typically vodka, with it. And what happens is there are what's called constituents within the herbs, things that are healing properties and whatever else, and those constituents are drawn out of the herb. Basically, the, the alcohol replaces, I think, the water in the herb or something like that. It pulls it out, in other words. So you take the herb, you put it in the uh, vodka mixture, and then you let it sit for a while, and it will pull all of it out. It actually creates it into a, see if I can get some, do this without it. Eh, you can't really see it too good. Um, it's kind of a light purple liquid, if you can kind of see that. Um, but the ghost pipe is a white little, it almost looks like a mushroom, but it's an herb. And it's, it's tremendous for pain relief. And it's not habit forming. It doesn't make you, you know, you just going around, you're a ghost pipe tincture junkie or something like that. <laughs> no. Um, it's just if you have a lot of really, really bad pain, ghost pipe tincture can actually help with that. You just take a few drops and put it on your tongue. Um, I wouldn't drink the whole bottle. That probably would be too, you know, kind of a bad idea. But there's no possible way you can get drunk. No possible way you can be brought under the power of that. All right. Um, you know, people say, well, there's some arguments that you can uh, do marijuana or use marijuana for pain relief or something. Well, can you do that without being brought under the power of it? Well, I don't know. I've never messed with it or whatever. Um, but I stay away from pharmaceuticals. And tinctures are something that is a very well-known, um, very good thing, in my opinion. But again, see, if I condemned all alcohol... And just went to Proverbs and said, well, see, it's not for kings and whatever else. Well, you could make those arguments, but, you know, um, then I condemn tinctures and I condemn other things like that. You know, and it's funny because a lot of guys that uh, would condemn alcohol for any reason, they'll take cough syrup. Cough syrup is pre predominantly alcohol, especially you get something like NyQuil. I took NyQuil all through my childhood. I get a really bad cold. They give me a teaspoon of NyQuil. And um, NyQuil is, I think, 95% alcohol or something like that. So if all, and my parents were totally, completely against alcohol. Um, I mean, and there's no reason for alcohol for any reason. Well, then what are you giving a child NyQuil for? They were giving me alcohol. So <laughs> uh, you have to be careful, the standards that you take as a Christian. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll go there next. We'll see the importance of um, not being drunk not being under the power of something like alcohol. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1-11 through 11, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Hmm. You say, well, it doesn't have anything to do with alcohol. It just means being serious. Keep reading. Verse 7. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken 
are drunken in the night. When's the best time to go out and get drunk? At night. Why? Because light hurts your eyes. Why do you think bars are dark? Why do you think when you get behind a drunkard and they're driving home and there's headlights coming towards them, they'll swerve into the other lane or, or swerve off the road, I should say, not in the other lane. They'll kind of swerve off the road or, you know, they'll, uh, because light hurts their eyes. Hmm. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Interesting. Verse 8, but let, uh, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Um, you don't have to shield yourself from reality as a Christian. You have to examine things by the word of God and say, huh, I'm supposed to watch and be sober. So you're constantly watching what's going on in the news and you say, oh, hey, food shortage stuff coming. I just heard that 10,000 cattle were died in Kansas because of supposed heat. Yeah, and all, meat processing plants are shutting down. And um, what's the uh, big one? Uh, it was owned by Hong Kong. I can't think of what the thing was. A big pork, you know, um, slaughter house thing. I keep thinking Johnson. I don't think it was Johnson. I forget what the name was. Write it in the comments if you know what I'm talking about. Um, the big pork producing facility. And uh, went up, uh, they went bankrupt and then they one of the places burned down. Hmm. Almost like they're trying to get rid of meat in this country and how many meat uh, facilities were shut down through the pandemic and all the other stuff. Interesting. Hmm. But um, we're supposed to watch and be sober. You say, well, I just, you know, it's a pro problems are so bad, I'm just going to go out and just get drunk. I don't even care anymore. I'm just going to get as drunk as I can to forget all this stuff. You want to be drunk when people come to your door and try to break in? I don't think so. But let's go to the boozer's favorite portion of, of Scripture. Okay? Is alcohol right or not? Jesus turned water into wine. That's, you'll hear that all the time. Well, I know that Jesus turned water into wine, so if he did it, I guess I can get drunk occasionally. <laughs> Let's check about that. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verse 1 through 11. Read the whole thing here, then we'll go back through and dissect this. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Interesting statement. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set, set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So there you go, Jesus turned water into wine, so therefore he's okay with alcohol, so you can drink as much as you want, get as drunk as you want. Uh, no. Um, there's a whole lot of things that are in that passage there that uh, most people just miss. The drunkard comes along and uses that as justification to get drunk. Um, other people come along and they'll say, well, you know, we're conservative Methodist, Baptist, whatever. Um, the wine that Jesus turned, the water that he turned into, into wine, it was just simply grape juice. Uh, no, that's not there either. All right, let's look at a couple points here. First and foremost, foremost, the Jews wanted wine 
which is a type of blood. More on that in the future. And Jesus says to Mary, I'll be doing future studies in other words. Jesus says to Mary, mine hour is not yet come. There in verse uh, number four. That's a weird statement, isn't it? Uh, we don't have any wine. We need some. Mine hour is not yet come. Huh? What's he talking about there? Well, if you look then at verse, uh, let me get my Bible here, verse 6, and there were six, and there were set there six water pots of stone. Six. Hmm. Kind of an interesting number there because six is the number of man. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, talk about man being created in God's image on the sixth day. Revelation chapter 13, verse 18, the 603 score and 6, because 6 is the number of a man. It talks about basically saying there. 6 is the number of a man. Hmm. But the third thing. So in other words, it's kind of, there's a spiritual tie in there. It's, it's sort of like the thing of the Lord is saying, you know, get 6 pots of water. and Or pots there. The Bible talks about, we read earlier about the vessels. And you take 6 there, number of a man, and you put water in them. Washing of water by the word, the Bible talks about, compared it to water. And then that water that's in there gets turned into blood, or wine in this case. And the Bible actually talks about wine being the blood of the grape. So I'm not just making that up. Um, number three, third point I want to make about that passage. The governor of the feast makes a difference between good wine and that which is worse. All right? He was not talking about grape juice. Okay, think about that. Oh, he just, it was just grape juice. Jesus, the, the miracle there was Jesus turned water into grape juice. Well, then how could he make a difference between good grape juice and bad grape juice? You can tell the difference between different ages of fermented wine. You get stuff that's just brand new. Well, eh, you get stuff that's really aged, like an old port or something like that uh, type of wine. Well, yeah, you're going to taste a the difference there. That's why you get people that are just fanatics for wine and they'll say this one's aged, you know, 60 years or something like that. Yeah, there's a difference there. So what was the point of that? Um, fourth point I want to make, the miracle that he did there shows that Jesus had power over creation, turning water into wine, but also he had power over time. He did it in an instant. He has power over creation, water into grape juice, and then over time, he ferments it, ferments it in an instant. Boom, like that. It's fermented. Here's 100-year-old aged wine like this, just with his word. See, um, it's interesting because if you study in back in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, which be doing an audio sermon, uploading an old audio sermon, for Sunday morning about the coming Exodus, comparing what happened with Moses and Elijah back in the Old Testament to what's going to happen with Moses and Elijah in the coming time of Jacob's trouble. Very interesting study. I preached it many years ago, back 2011, I think, is when it was. So the audio sermon will be up tomorrow. But if you study that thing, the Egyptian uh, magicians that worked for Pharaoh, they were copying a lot of the miracles that Moses did. Hmm. So they turned water into blood. Very interesting. Moses did it, and then the magicians of Pharaoh did it as well. Well, could they have turned water into wine? Quite possibly. But they couldn't have aged it. Hmm. So you see, if Jesus just said, okay, here, water into wine, boom, there you go. Well, that's pretty impressive. But water into aged wine? That shows that he's God. Very interesting there. A couple other points here. True fermented wine is living, as I discussed earlier, and contains healthy bacteria. Jesus is alive. The blood of Jesus Christ is alive. It's living. It's God's blood. Point number six. Grape juice is pasteurized and dead. And if you study it, the wicked Methodists were the ones that introduced grape juice into church communion services. They did this whole big thing. They got into the teetotaler movement and all this other stuff. And they came out and they absolutely forbid alcohol for any reason. It's the devil's, you know, liquor and all this other stuff. Um, 
Well, there are some bad types of wine out there. Like I said earlier, there are bad types of alcohol that are very synthetically produced and it's really bad for you. Um, there are ones that are produced correctly and those aren't bad for you. You know, one of the ancient, you know, things that the, the Vikings would drink would be mead, which was basically a fermented honey type of alcohol. And if you do that correctly, it'll actually clarify over the course of many years and it'll become clear, like a clear yellowish collar or whatever else. Um, pretty fascinating stuff. And there are people that have perfected this down to an art and they'll wait 20 years, 30 years, 40 years sometimes to really clarify the alcohol that they make. And it's completely natural. Natural yeasts and bacteria and everything else, that stuff's good for you if it's drunk in moderation. Okay. Um, point number seven that I want to make about this passage. The Passover is to be living wine and dead unleavened bread. If you read about that, they were saying about unleavened bread and wine. That's what they did with the Passover, the last supper there that Jesus did. Why? Because the life of the flesh is not in the flesh. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And there's some very deep implications we're going to be getting into when I bring out my big mega study. It's going to be multi-parts, very long, and the whole deal, it's profound on a whole different level. Um, but that's what it's supposed to be. So with the Methodist, Baptist type of communion, you have dead unleavened bread and dead on, you know, pasteurized grape juice. So you have dead, dead. With Roman Catholicism, with the Eucharist, you have the um, living bread and living wine. You say, no, it's just a wafer, it's dead, it's unleavened or whatever. Yeah, but when they teach about transubstantiation, it becomes the actual flesh of Jesus and the actual blood of Jesus, which is cannibalism, which is condemned in Scripture. So the Catholics have living, living. No, it's not right either. Baptist and Methodist, dead bread, dead wine. Catholics, living bread, living wine. Both are incorrect. What's the real way? Dead, unleavened bread. There's no leaven. There's no yeast in it to make it rise. No bacteria. It's unleavened. That's why it's flat. It's thin because there's nothing to make it puff up. Dead bread, living wine. I remember hearing a Baptist preacher say the one time about, you know, oh, the Catholics, they drink, you know, rotted grape juice. Okay, rotted grape juice is not wine. Wine is not rotted grape juice. I'll say it that way. A good true wine is fermented. Fermentation is not rotting. All right. <laughs> Fermentation requires a very specific controlled process. You don't just, you know, take a five-gallon bucket, throw a bunch of chopped up cabbage in there and hope for the best. No, you want to get a fermentation crock and you want to put layers of uh, cabbage that's chopped up and some salt on top, some good sea salt, and then another layer of cabbage, some more sea salt. You can put other types of things in there and, and whatever else that will ferment as well. We've made sauerkraut different times. We have the fermentation crocks for it. It's very good. Um, wine, true wine, you get the little stopper thing and you put it in there and you you monitor excuse me monitor it and everything else there's a very detailed process it's not rotted uh, grapes or something that's stupid nonsense but let me show you the importance of the thing of the dead flesh and the living blood first corinthians chapter 5 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 through 8. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto, the, unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. We aren't going to read the whole passage, but the man's basically having fornication with his father's wife. Whether that's his birth mother or stepmother, the text doesn't say, but it's either way it's really bad. Um, and Paul's saying you should deliver such an one to, for the destruction of the flesh. Um, look at verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? A little leaven? Hmm. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, 
as ye are unleavened. Ye are unleavened. That includes me. That includes you if you're saved. What is that? We're to be dead. Our flesh is dead. Mortify therefore your members. Present your body a living sacrifice. You're dead. You're buried with Christ. We are supposed to be unleavened. You don't introduce a little bit of leaven into your life. Why? Because it can take control of you. It can start to puff you up. Like leaven in bread would do. Know what I mean? You start to let some sins into your life and all of a sudden it starts to mess you up. You become something that God can't use because your flesh starts to get lively again. Um, watch out for music that exalts the flesh, that uh, has a rhythm to it that's faster than your natural heartbeat. Put your hand on your heart and feel that up here on your neck or on your wrist or whatever else. Hold my Bible, I can't, you know, like that. But uh, And if the beat in your music is faster than your heart rhythm, it's bad. Very bad for you. I can tell you that. It leads to increased pulse and everything in your, in your body. It's, it leads to aggression. Why do you think that they play heavy metal or rock and roll at fights or racing or other things, adrenaline type sports? You want to get the adrenaline up, raise the blood pressure up. Not real good. I mean, I thought that high blood pressure, you know, hypertension, I thought that that was a bad thing. Uh, well, unless you're doing some kind of... <laughs> sports or something like that which okay i realize if you're going climbing a mountain you know and there's no music at all you know obviously your blood pressure goes up don't get me wrong on what i'm saying there but i'm saying artificially inflating your blood pressure to make you more aggressive not a good idea all right um have to say little things like that because my enemies like to twist my words i do know what i'm talking about in spite of what they think but um Getting back to our text here, uh, verse 8. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old... Uh, well, let, me, let me finish verse 7. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Unleavened. We are supposed to put down our flesh. Don't make the flesh living. Stay away from anything that messes with the flesh. And brethren, quite frankly, um, unless you're really good and you know how to control the alcohol thing or whatever else, or you're just doing herbal tinctures like I showed earlier, I wouldn't mess with alcohol. It's not going to help you with your sanctification. All right? We're supposed to uh, have the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth in our lives. Finally, let's get back to Leviticus chapter 17. And this is kind of laying the groundwork for a bigger study that's coming out. Um, my mind is going to that bigger study. That's why I'm a little bit, my brain's going off on that and thinking what all should I say and whatever else before I get into it, into the bigger study that is. Uh, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 through 11. I'm not going to go off on a lot of the detail of the blood and the flesh and all the other stuff. That will be later. Um, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10 through 11. For whatsoever man, and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or, or, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Okay? Jesus' blood was shed on the cross. There's a lot of liars out there that say, I'm against the blood atonement. I don't know how in the world people come up with that. Um, I'm against making an overemphasis just on the blood and forgetting the fact that you have to call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. I'm against that teaching because that's satanic heresy. Um, it's death, burial, resurrection. If there's no resurrection from the dead, well then, you know, the blood being shed on the cross doesn't mean anything. Jesus could have shed his blood on the cross, and if he didn't come up from the dead, well, <laughs> doesn't mean anything. But uh, when Jesus died on the cross, and he's buried, 
you have to crucify yourself as a Christian. Your old man is buried, but you can do things to bring up that old man. And you start to add some leaven, and it starts to leaven the whole lump. And uh, alcohol of every kind has some form of leaven in it. Um, you know, yeast or just natural bacteria or whatever else. And so it can be dangerous as a Christian to mess around with that stuff. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We're supposed to be unleavened. All right? So the living thing that's in us is supposed to be the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'll explain, like I said, in future studies how that works out. What is the blood? How does that work? Big study. Um, I'm very tempted to get into it right now, but can't with all the scriptures that are involved. What I'm trying to say is, as a Christian, you have to make the Bible your final authority, your standard. But you can't go into the Bible and say the Bible flat out condemns alcohol for any reason. You can't do that. Um, what you have to say is, for me, I don't mess with it. I understand that there's leaven in alcohol. And if I get too much of that into my flesh, I'm actually going to be no longer unleavened. I'm going to start having a little bit too much wickedness in me. Okay? Um, I mean, you know, well, I thought you said earlier that there's bacteria, healthy bacteria and whatever, leaven type of things, um, things that rise in, in types of healthy breads, sprouted types of breads or, or you know, dairy products, yogurt and kefir and kombucha, fermented black tea and, you know, all that other stuff. Wasn't that the same? Well, you're not going to be brought under the power of it. Okay. Um, you don't see some guy laying along the road, laying there out of it, and he's got four bottles of empty kefir around him or something. No. Or, you know, oh, that guy, oh, he overdid it with his yogurt today, you know, or something. Oh, oh man, oh, there's old man, oh, the old drunk, town drunk here. Uh, he gets drunk on eating too much sauerkraut. No. Um, so, but, uh, so what's my answer at the end of the whole thing? The Bible does not condemn alcohol outright. It just doesn't. Um, drunkenness, obviously, it condemns that. Um, you just have to make up your own mind on it. Uh, if you're somebody that's had a lot of alcohol problems in your past, then definitely total abstinence is the way to go. Uh, if you are in a ministry position or if you are in a, an important position, definitely stay away from alcohol. I wouldn't even waste any time on it unless it's some kind of a herbal tincture or, you know, I don't really recommend cough syrup. But, you know, there are certain uses for it. Um, okay, fine. Um, just say, what about just a regular run-of-the-mill Christian? Well, you want to mess with it and whatever else, and you, it's not going to bring you under its power. Okay, but think about your testimony when you go out. You say, well, I can make some fermented stuff on my own. Okay, fine. That's okay. We've done that as well. Um, we made a fermented choke cherry slash apple drink the one time, and it was very good. And we didn't, we weren't sitting around, you know, the alcohol proof, and it was probably so low about that of kefir or uh, kombucha. No big deal. Um, you know, in the future, will I ever make any kind of tinctures, herbal tinctures? Well, probably. Um, I don't have a problem with that, taking a few drops. Not a big deal. Um, I also take some Solomon Seal tincture um, a lot of times on a daily basis just because it helps with joints and, and everything else. Not a problem. So that's going to be it for that study. Uh, hopefully it came out okay um, a little bit. My brain's really on this other big study. I have no idea what I'm going to get done with it because what's happening is I thought, okay, here's what my outline is for the sermon notes. Um, and I started writing, and I'm not going to get too close here because I don't want to give it away yet, but there's one page of sermon or of scriptures, a second page of scriptures, a third page of scriptures, and that's just part one, okay? Um, there's going to be at least three parts to the study, uh, and it's just getting bigger and snowballing and getting bigger and bigger. Um, no idea when it's coming out. Uh, turning into a much bigger thing than I originally thought. So 
Um, going to be a really big study when it does come out. Um, so, uh, I guess that's going to be it for this study. Again, you really need to pray about this whole thing of alcohol. Um, the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. Um, just be careful. Is the whole thing. I don't want people going out of here and saying Brian's okay with people drinking alcohol and therefore I, you know, can drink it and it maybe go a little bit far once in a while. If you're going too far, if you're ever losing any of your senses or whatever else, getting a little bit tippy, you're in the wrong at that point in time. That's being brought under the power of alcohol and ultimately the spirits that can come as a result of that. I wouldn't mess with it. So that is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.